This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. Sixth London edition by Charles Darwin Chapter 8 Part 1 Instinct Contents of this chapter include Instincts comparable with habits but different in their origin. Instincts graduated. Aphides and ants Instincts variable. Domestic instincts, their origin. Natural instincts of the cuckoo, molothrus, ostrich, and parasitic bees. Slave-making ants. Hive bee, its cell-making instinct. Changes of instinct and structure not necessarily simultaneous. Difficulties of the theory of natural selection of instincts. Neuter or sterile insects. Summary Many instincts are so wonderful that their development will probably appear to the reader a difficulty sufficient to overthrow my whole theory. I may here premise that I have nothing to do with the origin of the mental powers any more than I have with that of life itself. We are concerned only with the diversities of instinct and of the other mental faculties in animals of the same class. I will not attempt any definition of instinct. It would be easy to show that several distinct mental actions are commonly embraced by this term, but everyone understands what is meant when it is said that instinct impels the cuckoo to migrate and to lay her eggs in other birds' nests. An action which we ourselves require experience to enable us to perform when performed by an animal, more especially by a very young one, without experience, and when performed by many individuals in the same way, without their knowing for what purpose it is performed, is usually said to be instinctive. But I could show that none of these characters are universal. A little dose of judgment or reason, as Pierre Huber expresses it, often comes into play, even with animals low in the scale of nature. Frederick Cuvier and several of the older metaphysicians have compared instinct with habit. This comparison gives, I think, an accurate notion of the frame of mind under which an instinctive action is performed, but not necessarily of its origin. How unconsciously many habitual actions are performed indeed not rarely in direct opposition of our conscious will. Yet they may be modified by the will or reason. Habits easily become associated with other habits, with certain periods of time and states of the body. When once acquired, they often remain constant throughout life. Several other points of resemblance between instinct and habits could be pointed out. As in repeating a well-known song, so in instincts, one action follows another by a sort of rhythm. If a person be interrupted in a song, or in repeating anything by rote, he is generally forced to go back to recover the habitual train of thought. So P. Huber found it was with a caterpillar, which makes a very complicated hammock. For if he took a caterpillar which had completed its hammock up to, say, the sixth stage of construction, and put it into a hammock completed only to the third stage, the caterpillar simply reperformed the fourth, fifth, and sixth stages of construction. If, however, a caterpillar were taken out of a hammock made up, for instance, to the third stage, and were put into one finished up to the sixth stage, so that much of its work was already done for it, Far from deriving any benefit from this, it was much embarrassed and, in order to complete its hammock, seemed forced to start from the third stage, where it had left off, and thus tried to complete the already finished work. If we suppose any habitual action to become inherited, and it can be shown that this does sometimes happen, 
then the resemblance between what originally was a habit and an instinct becomes so close as not to be distinguished. If Mozart, instead of playing the pianoforte at three years old with wonderfully little practice, had played a tune with no practice at all, he might truly be said to have done so instinctively. But it would be a serious error to suppose that the greater number of instincts have been acquired by habit in one generation, and then transmitted by inheritance to succeeding generations. It can be clearly shown that the most wonderful instincts with which we are acquainted, namely those of the hive bee and of many ants, could not possibly have been acquired by habit. It will be universally admitted that instincts are as important as corporeal structures for the welfare of each species under its present conditions of life. Under changed conditions of life, it is at least possible that slight modifications of instinct may be profitable to a species. And if it can be shown that instincts do vary ever so little, then I can see no difficulty in natural selection preserving and continually accumulating variations of instinct to any extent that was profitable. It is thus, as I believe, that all the most complex and wonderful instincts have originated, as modifications of corporeal structure arise from, and are increased by, use or habit, and are diminished or lost by disuse, so I do not doubt it has been with instincts. But I believe that the effects of habit are in many cases of subordinate importance to the effects of the natural selection of what may be called spontaneous variations of instincts, that is, of variations produced by the same unknown causes, which produce slight deviations of bodily structure. No complex instinct can possibly be produced through natural selection, except by the slow and gradual accumulation of numerous, slight yet profitable, variations. Hence, as in the case of corporeal structures, we ought to find in nature not the actual transitional gradations by which each complex instinct has been acquired, for these could be found only in the lineal ancestors of each species, but we ought to find in the collateral lines of descent some evidence of such gradations, or we ought at least to be able to show that gradations of some kind are possible and this we certainly can do. I have been surprised to find, making allowance for the instincts of animals having been but little observed, except in Europe and North America, and for no instinct being known among extinct species, how very generally gradations, leading to the most complex instincts, can be discovered. Changes of instinct may sometimes be facilitated by the same species having different instincts at different periods of life, or at different seasons of the year, or when placed under different circumstances, etc., in which case either the one or the other instinct might be preserved by natural selection. And such instances of diversity of instinct in the same species can be shown to occur in nature. Again, as in the case of corporeal structure, and conformably to my theory, the instinct of each species is good for itself, but has never, as far as we can judge, been produced for the exclusive good of others. One of the strongest instances of an animal apparently performing an action for the sole good of another with which I am acquainted is that of aphides voluntarily yielding, as was first observed by Huber, their sweet excretion to ants. They do so voluntarily, the following facts show. I removed all the ants from a group of about a dozen aphides on a dock plant, and prevented their attendance during several hours. After this interval, I felt sure that the aphides would want to excrete. I watched them for some time through a lens, but not one excreted. I then tickled and stroked them with the hair in the same manner, as well as I could, as the ants do with their antennae, but not one excreted. 
Afterwards I allowed an ant to visit them, and it immediately seemed, by its eager way of running about, to be well aware what a rich flock it had discovered. It then began to play with its antennae on the abdomen first of one aphis and then of another, and each, as soon as it felt the antennae, immediately lifted up its abdomen and excreted a limpid drop of sweet juice, which was eagerly devoured by the ant. Even the quite young aphides behaved in this manner, showing that the action was instinctive and not the result of experience. It is certain from the observations of Huber that the aphides show no dislike to the ants. If the latter be not present, they are at last compelled to eject their excretion. But as the excretion is extremely viscid, it is no doubt a convenience to the aphides to have it removed. Therefore, probably they do not excrete solely for the good of the ants. Although there is no evidence that any animal performs an action for the exclusive good of another species, yet each tries to take advantage of the instincts of others, as each takes advantage of the weaker bodily structure of another species. So again, certain instincts cannot be considered as absolutely perfect, but as details on this and other such points are not indispensable, they may be here passed over. As some degree of variation in instincts under a state of nature, and the inheritance of such variations, are indispensable for the action of natural selection, as many instances as possible ought to be given, but want of space prevents me. I can only assert that instincts certainly do vary. For instance, the migratory instinct, both in extent and direction, and in its total loss. So it is with the nests of birds, which vary partly in dependence to the situations chosen, and on the nature and temperature of the country inhabited, but often from causes wholly unknown to us. Audubon has given several remarkable cases of differences in the nests of the same species in the northern and southern United States. Why, it has been asked, if instinct be variable, has it not granted to the bee the ability to use some other material when wax was deficient? But what other natural material could bees use? They will work, as I have seen, with wax hardened with vermilion or softened with lard. Andrew Knight observed that his bees instead of laboriously collecting propolis, used a cement of wax and turpentine with which he had covered decorticated trees. It has lately been shown that bees, instead of searching for pollen, will gladly use a very different substance, namely oatmeal. Fear of any particular enemy is certainly an instinctive quality, as may be seen in nestling birds. Though it is strengthened by experience and by the sight of fear of the same enemy in other animals. The fear of man is slowly acquired, as I have elsewhere shown, by the various animals which inhabit desert islands, and we see an instance of this even in England, in the greater wildness of all our large birds in comparison with our small birds, for the large birds have been most persecuted by man we may safely attribute the greater wildness of our large birds to this cause. For in uninhabited islands, large birds are not more fearful than small, and the magpie, so wary in England, is tame in Norway, as is the hooded crow in Egypt. That the mental qualities of animals of the same kind, born in a state of nature, vary much, could be shown by many facts. Several cases could also be adduced of occasional and strange habits in wild animals, which, if advantageous to the species, might have given rise, through natural selection, to new instincts. But I am well aware that these general statements, without the facts in detail, can produce but a feeble effort on the reader's mind. I can only repeat my assurance that I do not speak without good evidence. Inherited changes of habit or instinct in domesticated animals. 
the possibility, or even probability, of inherited variations of instinct in a state of nature will be strengthened by briefly considering a few cases under domestication. We shall thus be enabled to see the part which habit and the selection of so-called spontaneous variations have played in modifying the mental qualities of our domestic animals. It is notorious how much domestic animals vary in their mental qualities. With cats, for instance, one naturally takes to catching rats, and another mice, and these tendencies are known to be inherited. One cat, according to Mr. St. John, always brought home game birds, another hares or rabbits, and another hunted on marshy ground and almost nightly caught woodcocks or snipes. A number of curious and authentic instances could be given of various shades of disposition and taste, and likewise of the oddest tricks associated with certain frames of mind or periods of time. But let us look to the familiar case of the breeds of dogs. It cannot be doubted that young pointers, I have myself seen striking instances, will sometimes point and even back other dogs the very first time that they are taken out. Retrieving is certainly in some degree inherited by retrievers, and the tendency to run round, instead of at, a flock of sheep, by shepherd dogs. I cannot see that these actions, performed without experience by the young, and in nearly the same manner by each individual, performed with eager delight by each breed and without the end being known. For the young pointer can no more know that he points to aid his master than the white butterfly knows why she lays her eggs on the leaf of the cabbage. I cannot see that these actions differ essentially from true instincts. If we were to behold one kind of wolf, when young and without any training, as soon as it scented its prey, stand motionless like a statue, and then slowly crawl forward with a peculiar gait, and another kind of wolf rushing round instead of at a herd of deer, and driving them to a distant point, we should assuredly call these actions instinctive. Domestic instincts, as they may be called, are certainly far less fixed than natural instincts, but they have been acted on by far less vigorous selection, and have been transmitted for an incomparably shorter period under less fixed conditions of life. How strong these domestic instincts, habits, and dispositions are inherited, and how curiously they become mingled, is well shown when different breeds of dogs are crossed. Thus it is known that a cross with a bulldog has affected for many generations the courage and obstinacy of greyhounds, and a cross with a greyhound has given to the whole family of shepherd dogs a tendency to hunt hares. These domestic instincts, when thus tested by crossing, resemble natural instincts, which in a like manner become curiously blended together, and for a long period exhibit traces of the instincts of either parent. For example, Leroy describes a dog whose great-grandfather was a wolf, and this dog showed a trace of its wild parentage only in one way, by not coming in a straight line to his master when called. Domestic instincts are sometimes spoken of as actions which have become inherited solely from long-continued and compulsory habit, but this is not true. No one would ever have thought of teaching, or probably could have taught, the tumbler pigeon to tumble, an action which, as I have witnessed, is performed by young birds that have never seen a pigeon tumble. We may believe that some one pigeon showed a slight tendency to this strange habit, and that the long-continued selection of the best individuals in successive generations made tumblers what they are now. At New Glasgow there are house tumblers, as I hear from Mr. Brent, which cannot fly eighteen inches high without going head over heels. It may be doubted whether any one would have thought of training a dog to point, had not some one dog, 
naturally shown a tendency in this line, and this is known occasionally to happen, as I once saw in a pure terrier. The act of pointing is probably, as many have thought, only the exaggerated pause of an animal preparing to spring on its prey. When the first tendency to point was once displayed, methodical selection and the inherited effects of compulsory training in each successive generation would soon complete the work. And unconscious selection is still in progress, as each man tries to procure, without intending to improve the breed, dogs which stand and hunt best. On the other hand, habit alone in some cases has sufficed. Hardly any animal is more difficult to tame than the young of the wild rabbit. Scarcely any animal is tamer than the young of the tame rabbit. But I can hardly suppose that domestic rabbits have often been selected for tameness alone, so that we must attribute at least the greater part of the inherited change from extreme wildness to extreme tameness to habit and long-continued close confinement. Natural instincts are lost under domestication. A remarkable instance of this is seen in those breeds of fowls which very rarely or ever become broody, that is, never wish to sit on their eggs. Familiarity alone prevents our seeing how largely and how permanently the minds of our domestic animals have been modified. It is scarcely possible to doubt that the love of man has become instinctive in the dog. All wolves, foxes, jackals, and species of the cat genus, when kept tame, are most eager to attack poultry, sheep, and pigs, and this tendency has been found incurable in dogs which have been brought home as puppies from countries such as Tierra del Fuego and Australia, where the savages do not keep these domestic animals. How rarely, on the other hand, do our civilized dogs, even when quite young, require to be taught not to attack poultry, sheep and pigs? No doubt they occasionally make an attack, and are then beaten, and if not cured, they are destroyed, so that habit and some degree of selection have probably concurred in civilizing, by inheritance, our dogs. On the other hand, young chickens have lost wholly by habit that fear of the dog and cat, which no doubt was originally instinctive in them, for I am informed by Captain Hutton that the young chickens of the parent stock, the Gallus Bankiva, when reared in India under a hen, are at first excessively wild. So it is with young pheasants reared in England under a hen. It is not that chickens have lost all fear, but fear only of dogs and cats, for if the hen gives the danger chuckle, they will run, more especially young turkeys, from under her and conceal themselves in the surrounding grass or thickets, and this is evidently done for the instinctive purpose of allowing as we see in wild ground birds, their mother to fly away. But this instinct retained by our chickens has become useless under domestication, for the mother hen has almost lost by disuse the power of flight. Hence we may conclude that under domestication instincts have been acquired, and natural instincts have been lost, partly by habit and partly by man selecting and accumulating during successive generations, peculiar mental habits and actions, which at first appeared from what we must, in our ignorance, call an accident. In some cases compulsory habit alone has sufficed to produce inherited mental changes. In other cases compulsory habit has done nothing, and all has been the result of selection, pursued both methodically and unconsciously but in most cases habit and selection have probably concurred. Special Instincts We shall, perhaps, best understand how instincts in a state of nature have become modified by selection by considering a few cases. I will select only three, namely the instinct which leads the cuckoo to lay her eggs in other birds' nests the slave-making instinct of certain ants, and the cell-making power of the hive-bee. 
these two latter instincts have generally and justly been ranked by naturalists as the most wonderful of all known instincts. Instincts of the Cuckoo It is supposed by some naturalists that the more immediate cause of the instinct of the cuckoo is that she lays her eggs not daily, but at intervals of two or three days, so that if she were to make her own nest and sit on her own eggs, those first laid would have to be left for some time unincubated, or there would be eggs and young birds of different ages in the same nest. If this were the case, the process of laying and hatching might be inconveniently long, more especially as she migrates at a very early period, and the first hatched young would probably have to be fed by the male alone. But the American cuckoo is in this predicament, for she makes her own nest and has eggs and young successively hatched all at the same time. It has been both asserted and denied that the American cuckoo occasionally lays her eggs in other birds' nests, but I have lately heard from Dr. Merrill of Iowa that he once found in Illinois a young cuckoo together with a young jay in the nest of a blue jay, Garrulus cristatus, and as both were nearly full feathered, there could be no mistake in their identification. I could also give several instances of various birds which have been known occasionally to lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Now let us suppose that the ancient progenitor of our European cuckoo had the habits of the American cuckoo, and that she occasionally laid an egg in another bird's nest. If the old bird profited by this occasional habit, through being enabled to emigrate earlier, or through any other cause, or if the young were made more vigorous by advantage being taken of the mistaken instinct of another species than when reared by their own mother, encumbered as she could hardly fail to be by having eggs and young of different ages at the same time, then the old birds or the fostered young would gain an advantage. And analogy would lead us to believe that the young thus reared would be apt to follow by inheritance the occasional and aberrant habit of their mother, and in their turn would be apt to lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and thus be more successful in rearing their young. By a continued process of this nature, I believe that the strange instinct of our cuckoo has been generated. It has also recently been ascertained on sufficient evidence by Adolf Müller, that the cuckoo occasionally lays her eggs on the bare ground, sits on them, and feeds her young. This rare event is probably a case of reversion to the long-lost aboriginal instinct of nidification. It has been objected that I have not noticed other related instincts and adaptations of structure in the cuckoo, which are spoken of as necessarily coordinated. But in all cases, speculation of an instinct, known to us only in a single species, is useless, for we have hitherto had no facts to guide us. Until recently, the instincts of the European and of the non-parasitic American cuckoo alone were known. Now, owing to Mr. Ramsey's observations, we have learned something about three Australian species, which lay their eggs in other birds' nests. The chief points to be referred to are three. First, that the common cuckoo, with rare exceptions, lays only one egg in a nest, so that the large and voracious young bird receives ample food. Secondly, that the eggs are remarkably small, not exceeding those of a skylark, a bird about one-fourth as large as the cuckoo. That the small size of the egg is a real case of adaptation we may infer from the fact of the non-parasitic American cuckoo lying full-sized eggs. Thirdly, that the young cuckoo, soon after birth, has the instinct, the strength, and a properly shaped back for ejecting its foster brothers, which then perish from cold and hunger. This has been boldly called a beneficent arrangement, in order that the young cuckoo may get sufficient food, 
and that its foster-brothers may perish before they had acquired much feeling. Turning now to the Australian species, though these birds generally lay only one egg in a nest, it is not rare to find two and even three eggs in the same nest. In the bronze cuckoo, the eggs vary greatly in size, from eight to ten lines in length. Now, if it had been an advantage to this species to have laid eggs even smaller than those now laid, so as to have deceived certain foster parents, or, as is more probable, to have been hatched within a shorter period, for it is asserted that there is a relation between the size of eggs and the period of their incubation, then there is no difficulty in believing that a race or species might have been formed which would have laid smaller and smaller eggs, for these would have been more safely hatched and reared. Mr. Ramsay remarks that two of the Australian cuckoos, when they lay their eggs in an open nest, manifest a decided preference for nests containing eggs similar in colour to their own. The European species apparently manifests some tendency towards a similar instinct, but not rarely departs from it, as is shown by her laying her dull and pale-coloured eggs in the nest of the hedge warbler with bright greenish-blue eggs. Had our cuckoo invariably displayed the above instinct, it would assuredly have been added to those which it is assumed must all have been acquired together. The eggs of the Australian bronze cuckoo vary, according to Mr. Ramsay, to an extraordinary degree in colour, so that in this respect, as well as in size, natural selection might have secured and fixed any advantageous variation. In the case of the European cuckoo, the offspring of the foster parents are commonly ejected from the nest within three days after the cuckoo is hatched, and as the latter at this age is in a most helpless condition, Mr. Gould was formerly inclined to believe that the act of ejection was performed by the foster parents themselves, but he has now received a trustworthy account of a young cuckoo which was actually seen while still blind and not able even to hold up its own head in the act of ejecting its foster brothers. One of these was replaced in the nest by the observer and was again thrown out. With respect to the means by which this strange and odious instinct was acquired, if it were of great importance for the young cuckoo, as is probably the case, to receive as much food as possible soon after birth, I can see no special difficulty in its having gradually acquired, during successive generations, the blind desire, the strength and the structure necessary for the work of ejection, for those cuckoos which had such habits and structure best developed, would be the most securely reared. The first step towards the acquisition of the proper instinct might have been more unintentional restlessness on the part of the young bird, when somewhat advanced in age and strength, the habit having been afterwards improved and transmitted to an earlier age. I can see no more difficulty in this than in the unhatched young of other birds acquiring the instinct to break through their own shells, or than in young snakes acquiring in the upper jaws, as Owen has remarked, a transitory sharp tooth for cutting through the tough egg shell. For if each part is liable to individual variations at all ages, and the variations tend to be inherited at a corresponding or earlier age, propositions which cannot be disputed, then the instincts and structure of the young could be slowly modified as surely as those of the adult, and both cases must stand or fall together with the whole theory of natural selection. Some species of the Molothrus, a widely distinct genus of American birds, allied to our starlings, have parasitic habits like those of the cuckoo, and the species present an interesting gradation in the perfection of their instincts. The sexes of Molothrus badius are stated by an excellent observer, Mr. Hudson, sometimes to live promiscuously together in flocks, 
and sometimes to pair. They either build a nest of their own, or seize on one belonging to some other bird, occasionally throwing out the nestings of the stranger. They either lay their eggs in the nest thus appropriated, or oddly enough build one for themselves on the top of it. They usually sit on their own eggs and rear their own young, but Mr. Hudson says it is probable that they are occasionally parasitic, for he has seen the young of this species following old birds of a distinct kind and clamouring to be fed by them. The parasitic habits of another species of Molothrus, the M. bonariensis, are much more highly developed than those of the last, but are still far from perfect. This bird, as far as it is known, invariably lays its eggs in the nests of strangers, but it is remarkable that several together sometimes commence to build an irregular untidy nest of their own, placed in singular ill-adapted situations, as on the leaves of a large thistle. They never, however, as far as Mr. Hudson has ascertained, complete a nest for themselves. They often lay so many eggs, from fifteen to twenty, in the same foster nest that few or none can possibly be hatched. They have, moreover, the extraordinary habit of pecking holes in the eggs, whether of their own species or of their foster parents, which they find in the appropriated nests. They drop also many eggs on the bare ground, which are thus wasted. A third species, the M. pecoris, of North America, has acquired instincts as perfect as those of the cuckoo, for it never lays more than one egg in a foster nest, so that the young bird is securely reared. Mr. Hudson is a strong disbeliever in evolution, but he appears to have been so much struck by the imperfect instincts of the Molothrus bonariensis that he quotes my words and asks, Must we consider these habits not as especially endowed or created instincts, but as small consequences of one general law, namely transition. Various birds, as has already been remarked, occasionally lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. This habit is not very uncommon with the Gallinaceae, and throws some light on the singular instinct of the ostrich. In this family several hen birds unite, and lay first a few eggs in one nest, and then in another, and these are hatched by the males. This instinct may probably be accounted for by the fact of the hens laying a large number of eggs, but, as with the cuckoo, at intervals of two or three days. The instinct, however, of the American ostrich, as in the case of the Molothrus bonariensis, has not as yet been perfected, for a surprising number of eggs lay strewed over the plains, so that in one day's hunting I picked up no less than twenty lost and wasted eggs. Many bees are parasitic, and regularly lay their eggs in the nests of other kinds of bees. This case is more remarkable than that of the cuckoo, for these bees have not only had their instincts, but their structure modified in accordance with their parasitic habits, for they do not possess the pollen-collecting apparatus which would have been indispensable if they had stored up food for their own young. Some species of Sphagidae, wasp-like insects, are likewise parasitic, and M. Faber has lately shown good reason for believing that, although the Tachytis nigra generally makes its own burrow, and stores it with paralyzed prey for its own larvae, yet that when this insect finds a burrow already made and stored by another sphex, it takes advantage of the prize and becomes for the occasion parasitic. In this case, as with that of the Molothrus or Cuckoo, I can see no difficulty in natural selection making an occasional habit permanent if of advantage to the species. And if the instinct whose nest and stored food are feloniously appropriated be not thus exterminated. 
End of chapter 8, part 1